Hello, everyone. This is Vasu Sham, and I'm here with Nick Ondo. Hi, Nick. Hi, Hi I'm Nick Ondo. <laughs> so I am a postdoctoral researcher at Stanford University and a Branko Weiss Fellow. And my research interests are in the gauge gravity duality or holography and its application to spaces with positive cosmological constant. And I met my friend, Nick, who is welcome to introduce himself. Uh, yeah, hi, I'm Nick. Um, I am no longer a physicist. I'm currently a software engineer in machine learning at Google. Um, my Back when I was in physics, however, my uh, topic of study was massive gravity and basically different types of viewing it through the lens of different types of quantum modifications of uh, general relativity. Thank you, Nick. So as I was saying, we met on Discord, which was a Indeed. fun and happy coincidence. Um, <laughs> and Nick had a particular research question that he never got to the bottom of, he felt, during his PhD, which he wanted to discuss with uh, some of us who are still active in, in research. Mm -hmm. uh, do you remember what that was, Nick? And would you would you want to recapitulate? Uh, it might take us off course, but yeah, it was just an interesting question I had about um, basically whether or not you could have consistent mass of spin one uh, particles that weren't like a that didn't have like a Higgs UV completion. If there was some way to like have some type of more asymptotic fragility scenario, or sorry, asymptotic safety scenario. Um, yeah, we can go into yeah. that in more detail. I worry that it would uh, steer us off course, but <laughs> sure, sure. Um, well, that's just to say that um, Nick maintained his interest in, uh, in research, uh, despite not working in, in academia, which I find quite commendable. And although I couldn't help him with uh, the question that, um, that he asked me all, all, all the way back then, uh, I certainly found that there was something that we could work on together and it had more to do with my research interests of uh, holography and in particular, in understanding holography in finite volume space-time regions. Which brings us to the topic of today's discussion, which is our recent paper uh, titled The Role of DRGT Mass Terms in Cutoff Holography and the Randall syndrome 2 Scenario. Um, but before we, launch into a technical discussion about what that really is, we should break down roughly the three or four major topics that this paper sits at the overlap of. One is massive gravity, uh, which is what Nick is an expert in, which is what he studied during his PhD. Uh, another is holography, specifically holography in regions of finite space-time volume, which for reasons I'll explain, it's also called cutoff holography. And then there's the topic of canonical gravity, I guess canonical quantum gravity, uh, which is a sort of more old fashioned um, pursuit, which had some mixed successes. And there's also the brain world scenarios uh, of Randall syndrome um, and extensions thereof. So since we've already talked a little bit about massive gravity, could you please um, elaborate, Nick, on what you specifically mean by that? Um, by massive gravity, like in particular? Yeah, so the, the, yeah. the brand of the DRGT massive gravity, which is the, uh, which is our best understanding of, of such a theory. Yeah, so I mean, essentially coming out a lot of the research in the early 2000s about the brain world scenarios that kind of spawned out of actually the Randall syndrome. Um, brain world scenario, I guess, as we call them. Uh, people were kind of playing around with different ideas uh, relating to massive gravity, because they noticed that like when you try to add in these brain scenarios, you would always get like kind of massive modes of the graviton. And so then people eventually started like trying to study like, could you have like a massive mode of a graviton like in isolation, not as a part of some weird spectrum from like dimensions and mixing, but like just an actual like isolated massive spin two mode. And uh, Basically, people, for a lot of reasons in the 70s, didn't believe it was possible. Um, and 
there was at least some progress uh, made showing that some of the no-go theorems that you couldn't have a mass of spin two field in isolation uh, were shown not to be true in a 2000. 10, I think it was 2010 or 2011 paper uh, by Gregory Gabadatsky, Andrew Tully, and Claudia Duram. Um, so Andrew Tully became my advisor and I became his graduate student in 2012, I think it was. So right around the time when I started working with him was when that discovery had been made. So I, uh, I uh, you know, worked with them on uh, different ideas and massive gravity and, and playing around with it. A lot of the stuff I looked at was like supersymmetry and how it can be combined. But yeah, the idea is essentially, can you, like general relativity is the theory of a massless spin two field. So would you still have a gravity like theory if you dropped the mass condition and, and made the fundamental particle of gravity be have like have a mass? And then what are the consequences of that? Right, so these are presumably the papers that uh, you're referring to mm -hmm. <clears throat> among others. And uh, for reference, I guess we should say that uh, the Thiers Pauli action uh, was was the was a historic precursor to, to this theory, um, where, where we were just talking about linearized metric fluctuations. And we then want to answer the question, well, how can we give mass to the, this problem? So, so in regular general relativity, were we to linearize around uh, the flat background, we would have a um, free massless spin two mode with action roughly of the form um, So we have some fluctuation metric mu nu, and then there's going to be some gauge in which we have this this uh, yeah fairly simple action. And um, then the question is, can we add a mass term, which means a some ultra local term quadratic in this fluctuation field H, which plays the role of the mass. And immediately we see that it's not as straightforward to write no. down a single mass term given a tensor, uh, just because there are two things we can form that look like h squared. Yeah, it's so like, we can have. Yeah, it's the opposite of the vector, right? With a vector, we can only really take the inner product. But with a tensor, obviously, now we have two indices. And so like we essentially have a trace-like object. And then we have uh, basically a matrix product and a trace of that, if we want to speak in kind of linear algebra terms. So there's two different objects you can construct. So you yeah. can then basically take, in principle, you could take any linear combination and maintain Lorentz invariance. Uh, but it turns out that Lorentz invariance is not sufficient to have a consistent theory here. Right, right. And so what Fierce and Pauli proposed was to just have this combination. Yep. And uh, for a very long time, this was all people knew about um, massive gravity. Um, and there wasn't any understanding about how to take this to some nonlinear theory. Right, so, so how do we take this to some theory that we can write down, not in terms of a background field split, but, but really in terms of some nonlinear metric field? Until these papers came along, where they did propose an action. And uh, well, I suppose that here we can already say that once the graviton becomes massive, we no longer have the gauge invariances that general relativity enjoys. Uh, due to the presence of the graviton mass. Yeah, in the same way that a mass of spin one field no longer has the gauge symmetry. Well, you can still work the gauge symmetry back in, but yeah, the, the fundamentally you yeah you broken constraints uh, with a mass term. Exactly. So well, okay, let's just uh, let's let's not make this uh, too schematic. Uh, at least attempt to have some conventions here that. Yeah, it's I it's worth adding. Yeah, it's worth adding here just for a point of clarity. Um, in principle, like normally, uh, we would say, okay, cool. Uh, well, it's a tensor now. So all of a sudden, we now have like um, a two parameter family of mass terms. Um, and that's just kind of the end of the story. So the just a very quick statement about why we need to take this specific linear combination and we only get to like which is one mass parameter is because if you don't take those then you're 
essentially going to uh, lose a constraint in your theory. And it turns out that um, that the thing that you were projecting out with that constraint was a ghostly mode. Um, there's several different analyses. You can do this if you want the details. I guess you can look at my PhD thesis because I go through it pretty uh, carefully. Um, but yeah, this is like a, a really simple kind of, uh, it's an unobvious, I guess, at first blush, but it's a, it's a problem that you get in massive theories that like, because you don't have the gauge symmetry anymore, um, you basically, uh, there's many different ways you can phrase this, but essentially you, you don't have the, the larger projection that you do for massless theories. So you have more degrees of freedom and now you have to worry about whether or not those degrees of freedom are healthy. So they could be super luminal, they could be ghostly. So they go to a netic, uh, negative kinetic term and have lots of problems or maybe they could be tachyonic or other things, right? So there's like new problems that you have to worry about because there's fundamentally new degrees of freedom and massive theories that you can't find in their massless counterparts. Right, right. And I guess one way to think about it is the fact that when H is transverse and trace free in four dimensions, you would have two degrees of freedom, which you normally think of as the polarization modes of the graviton. And then uh, what we want to do is go up to five. Um, whereas naively, if I were to just count um, how many degrees of freedom I have here, I have the potential to really go up to six. And then you want to pull back one, but not the other. And then you can easily see how you how there's room for one of those to be one of those to be ghastly, and then um, you know constraint will probably do as well in removing one of them. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, there's there's a lot that this uh, seemingly very simple choice hides, and um, yeah. th 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 that is a very interesting and rich part of the story. And yeah. in whatever it is that we did. Uh, and well, I guess in extending what it is we did, we'll probably encounter some of these subtleties. Um, but that's that, that that discussion can wait uh, a little bit longer. So let's go back to the question of how to write down actions for nonlinear actions for massive gravity. Um, and so as we discussed, even though we have the five degrees of freedom here in four dimensions, uh, we have certainly broken diffeomorphism invariance. Um, and so what we want to do is have a parameterization of the fields that um, reflects this fact, but also um, be a little bit parsimonious about how we go about it. So I suppose the first version of this theory involving the metric field had a an interesting formulation involving two metrics, right? So, so the, there was a, a background metric and then there was the dynamical fluctuating metric, which, um, yeah, I mean, we can try to write down what those mass terms look like, but the most elegant version of these theories involves frame fields or field lines instead of metrics. So just to set our conventions, what we mean by the field line is this square root type object for the metric where um, this quadratic combination of E, the frame field, gives us G, the metric. And so having two metrics, which we can say G and H, can be traded um, for having, say, two kinds of frame fields, E and F. And um, the basic structure of massive gravity, the massive gravity action, was to take the Einstein-Hilbert action Einstein Hilbert action for one of these fields, and then have mixing mass terms involving both of these fields, roughly. And presumably we could have a, an Einstein Hilbert type uh, term for the second field. It's just that we're not varying with respect to the second one. So, there's this interesting biometric structure uh, that's yep. baked into these theories. And 
these mass terms are what we're most interested in. So there's, there's really a family we can write in principle, right? So, so we can write D dimensions, basically a kind of wedge product of E's and F's, right? So we can write down um, the alternating symbol. and take wedge products of E's and F's Yeah, so um yeah, it's interesting that uh, these turn out to be uh, the objects that describe mass of gravity, but they do for really interesting reasons. There's a lot of different ways you can sort of package them up together. Um, so you can write them this way, where it's just like combinations of E's and F's. A slightly simpler way of working with them usually is obviously the E minus F combinations, because you can tune mm -hmm. you can tune all of these uh, M, M sub I squared terms to um, because there's basically one m squared term here. Although in principle they could be negative, so it doesn't even have to be um, an m squared term. But uh, sure. yeah, so, I mean, you so can basically tune write... them to get yeah you know, some different forms. Yeah, yeah, good. Um, so, so the most generic structure uh, is just you have these a sum of terms involving wedge products between some number of e's and some number of f's in order to find in order to form this this form of top degree. And what Nick is saying is that actually you can simplify this um, to a term which is proportional to some combination of E, e minus F. And here I'll just, so K here was arbitrary. And uh, now I'll just use another arbitrary index <laughs> yeah. label. Uh, so you have E minus F So now I'm going to split it like this and um, you can just have F's to pad the rest. Yep. And if it wasn't explicit before, we should say here that E is the dynamical field, the field we actually vary with respect to, whereas F is treated as a background field. And this fact will play a key role in our discussion of holography as well. Um, so this is, I suppose, the schematic structure of all of the mass terms that people are interested in. And for our purposes in this paper, uh, the protagonist is going to be quadratic, quadratic mass term, which has the structure of basically containing just two E minus Fs. So yep. yeah, it's kind of one of the nicest of the mass of gravity terms, um, at least in terms of its simplicity. Right. So um, no, would you get a comment on that in the context of mass of gravity before we, um, yeah, before we really shift away from the original motivation? Uh, yeah, there's, um, yeah, there's a couple of different things to say here. Technically, there's other mass terms, I should say, as well, where you wedge out with E's instead of the F's. Those are also valid mass, uh, mass gravity terms. Um, but yeah, in terms of the um, the E minus F squared term, where you have two of them together, um, 
Yeah, they're nice. They, they're the natural objects that come out of something called deconstruction, um, which is an idea which motivated a lot of our paper. Uh, in fact, when uh, you and I first met, you were talking about like, is it possible that there's some like higher dimensional uh, form? Because in the quantum gravity, well, we'll get into this, I guess, but in the quantum gravity realm, obviously you're directly relating some type of like higher dimensional bulk theory to some boundary one lower, to, like a co-dimension one uh, uh, boundary theory. And there's just a lot of questions about like how, how that would work. Good, good. So, so yeah. let's get into that that discussion then, because in during your PhD in your research, you focused on this um, interesting technique called deconstruction, right? Which you which you briefly outlined, but but would you care to just elaborate on that so that we can? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's um, there's a there's a lot of different like philosophies on it, but like the general idea is, in essence, what if we took a it's actually very similar to the game that you're playing with Klutz Klein. So in Klutz Klein, right, like traditionally you would take some higher dimensional theory, like, I don't know, D equals five or D equals 11 uh, super gravity, and you compactify it down to remove, you compactify it down and then throw out the massive modes, and you end up with some consistent low energy effective uh, theory. And there, everything's kind of like pretty mathematically well-defined up to potential quantum corrections. Um, and that's nice. In dimensional deconstruction, you're doing something kind of like more uh, brutal, if you will, where you're saying, let's let's um let's not treat this as being like some geometric procedure that we can sort of rigorously say like the, like the the higher dimensional theory implies the lower dimensional theory instead we're just going to try to brute force some of the nice structures about the higher dimensional theory and just try to shoehorn them into the lower dimensional theory and the game that you're essentially playing is that you can view the extra dimension that you're not compactifying, but you're deconstructing, which is to say, essentially, you're taking lattice, you're making a mm -hmm. continuous dimension into a lattice sized dimension. And then objects basically end up taking on not just the ordinary, like, um, like it was a tensor, it would still have the, the two indices for it, but it pick up essentially a site index as well. And then you can, you can think about um, what would derivatives in that space that could get deformed into some like linear map, kind of the same way that we set up like actual numerical experiments, right? We, we essentially like take a, a discrete definition of a derivative and we say, okay, cool, we'll take like um, x at n plus one minus x at n, where n plus one is the site next door next to it. And then we can say like, that's a, that's a version of a derivative, right? Um, mm -hmm. So you can play games like this, where you can th consider a generalized linear mapping on the site space and replace the derivative. And it turns out you can get an interesting bunch of theories. Uh, one of them is if you use the Fearbein well, one trivial one is like if you start off with like let's say five dimensional yang mills theory and you compactify or sorry you deconstruct down to um some four dimensional theory you'll really easily end up with the proka yang mills theory which is pretty cool um and you'll get the right here it's fairly trivial but you get the right degrees of freedom and exactly the right structure um for for uh proka what's less mm -hmm. trivial is for gravity where there's obviously way more complicated uh index in, in this, uh, um, index gymnastics that you can do where it's, there's like just more stuff that can contract with other stuff. And for DRGT, we, we saw that there was that really specific structure of it had to be like, um, it had to be wedges of the different fear bind that you have. Um, mm -hmm. And it turns out for if you take like, for instance, 5D, um, this was true for any dimension, but if you take like, so let's say five dimensional general relativity, pure general relativity, and you uh, deconstruct that down, um, if you do it, if you deconstruct it on fear bind, so you're taking the derivatives on the fear bind, not on the metric, that's actually crucial. Uh, I think Neymar Khan even had who came up with it. One of the first things he tried was actually to do this on uh, gravitation, but he did it in the metric variables. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that that will not work. Um, you'll, okay. you'll end up with ghosts. But if you do it in so, fear so bind. Was this, was this the paper, by the way? Just, just, um, just I don't, I, I think that was, he originally was looking at it in some really weird scenario where he, I can't remember the specific motivation. It was something like he wanted to have like a tower of four dimensional Yang Mills theories um, approximately look like a five dimensional Yang Mills theory. Um, and so he was basically exclusively concerned with like, um, well, as it says in the paper name, electroweak symmetry breaking. So he's mm -hmm. mostly interested in like a Yang Mills Higgs type system. Um, but he, in a later paper he did, I believe he looked pretty, pretty certain that he looked at the um, deconstruction of, of gravity itself. Uh, it might've been the next paper, I'm not sure. Cause it was, I think it was the okay. series of papers that he worked on with Georgie and Cohen. 
Um, okay. But anyway, sorry, yeah, TLDR, <laughs> just to wrap this up. Um, yeah, you end, it turns out that essentially the way that you can view it is anyone who's ever done like ADM Hamiltonian will be able to intuit essentially what's going on here. Um, and the point is, is basically, if you do a D plus one split on general relativity, if you've ever done that before, like to do um, any AD, like any ADM or Hamiltonian analysis, you'll you'll know immediately that basically what you get is the higher dimensional Ricci scalar gets converted into a lower dimensional Ricci scalar plus an extrinsic curvature squared term, and the extrinsic curvature squared term up to a choice of gauge, uh, which we, we do have to impose uh, kind of arbitrarily, um, you end up with uh, basically dy fearbein and then that dear dy fearbein you can turn into the e minus f combination so you're going to like do a brute force discretization like that uh but if you do that then you end up with um you end up with like exactly the mass of gravity terms that you're looking for so you'll have to trust me that like all the wedge product structure comes out and, and that works naturally um but it actually does and so you end up getting uh kind of the exact right structure in a very natural way in Fairbairn language by deconstructing it. So that was discovered by um, uh, Duram, yeah, Claudia Duram, Andrew Tully, and uh, Andrew Mattis. And back in uh, 2013, I believe it was. Right. So it was so a cool discovery. Yeah, yeah, we were super, we were super uh, hopeful that uh, there was going to be more that came out of this. I was always convinced that there uh, was going to be something more. In the end, we f we found that a bunch of other like generalizations of dimensional deconstruction never really quite worked out. Like we tried to uh, we tried to revisit like charge spin two fields and it did not work at all. <laughs> at all. Um, we just ended up with a whole bunch more. It was interesting no goes, but um, sort of I don't think any of it was unexpected. Um, but we gave it a go and it was cool. Um, the th area that I proceeded on in my PhD was largely like, could you could you do like a supersymmetric extension of this? So could you take like a, a supergravity theory and try and deconstruct it and what would you get out? Um, and we have we we ended up with a Lagrangian. Um, I didn't have time to finish whether or not this Lagrangian was actually ghost free or not, but um, it seemed like it was cool and had interesting properties. Yeah. Great, that's something to pick up on. So very briefly, the basic idea is you start with a massless the theory of uh, either gravitons, gluons, photons, whatever, in mm -hmm. d plus one dimensions. And then you do this procedure where you um, discretize derivatives along a certain direction, mm -hmm. right? And treat the field evaluated at different lattice points as separate fields. And then interpret the resulting theory of having discretized this as a massive gauge theory or gravitational theory. Yep. Right? So very briefly, well, okay, this is the path that didn't work. So let me just jump to frame fields. Yep. Uh, this is big E. Maybe. So, so the trick is just to write this as uh, the difference of two Two frame fields evaluated at different lattice points in the d direction. Well, let me just write it as proportional to. Uh, just so yeah, usually called z or y conventionally, but yeah, just one of the dimensions you know, that you isolate out. And then plug this back into the uh, this this uh, split form of the action. Sorry, there's also going to be uh, d. I've, I've committed to this notation, so I'm just gonna. <laughs> you have two DXDs now, but okay. Uh, <laughs> oh, I see. I see. Yeah. I see what you mean. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it was. It's sorry, probably sorry, better sorry. that we bail yeah, and go with Y or Z, but it's it's okay. We we accept that X. Okay, we, we we have to do we have to deal with whatever it is. We've dug our <laughs> we've dug ourselves this, this hole. Yeah. Okay. Um. And so so the the basic idea, which is just to say, wow. Well, Okay, plug this back in here, and we're going to get something. I mean, it's conceivable. We'll, we'll go into details later, but, but it's conceivable. If I were to plug this expression for the extensive curvature back into the top line, then the resulting expression will look a lot like those mass terms that we were looking at before. So these kinds of expressions, yeah. basically, yep. right? And so that's that's the basic idea behind deconstruction. And as you emphasized, it's 
it's it's an it's an algorithm to go from a five dimensional massless gravitational theory to a four dimensional say massive gravitational theory not very uh sensitive to the exact number of dimensions this just works generally and um what got me excited about hearing this is that i remembered um this nice paper paper by uh my mentor and colleague at the time at the perimeter institute laurent friedel on a kernel formula for what he called reconstructing ads cft and then uh, years later years after this paper was written uh, in 2019 there were a series of follow-up papers well actually it was actually even in 2016 uh, that it was noticed that this formula that Laurent wrote, which I will reproduce momentarily, played a key role in what's called the TT bar deformation. And that the TT bar deformation played a key role in holography with a finite radial cutoff in three dimensions. So let's unpack these two layers and then we can go into our actual paper. So first, um, what is the TT bar deformation? Well, as uh, Smirnov, Zamolodzikov, and these other authors um, showed us, there exists a solvable, irrelevant operator deformation of two-dimensional conformal field theories built from components of the energy momentum tensor. So we switch gears here. We've left the realm of general relativity and modifications such as massive gravity. And now we're talking about uh, non-gravitational conformal field theories and quantum field theories. So here, what's surprising about the statement I just made is that there is an irrelevant operator called the TT bar operator, which is shorthand for the following combination of stress tensor components which in a conformal field theory becomes the product between the holomorphic and anti-holomorphic components of the stress tensor. But more generally, it's going to uh, be corrected by uh, the trace squared, which you wouldn't see in a conformal field theory. Um, so it's this combination, which takes a little while to write. <clears throat> okay, so, so this is the operator we call TT bar. Now, in a theory that enjoys Poincaré invariance, the stress tensor is conserved. Sorry, it's, it is worth pointing out this is specifically in two dimensions, but yeah. Right, right, good, good. So this is in the this is in the context of two-dimensional um, quantum field theory, which is what both of these theories looked at, or both of these papers looked at. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, they weren't even strictly interested in conformal field theories per se. They were interested in just integrable quantum field theories. So integrable quantum field theories in two dimensions are these peculiar intermediaries between free theories and interacting the fully interacting theories. They, they are certainly interacting, but they interact in a very nice way in that all of their S matrices are just composed of elastic two-body S matrices. So all the scattering is just a composition of two to two scattering in these theories. And that makes them exactly solvable. So there's a vast literature in mathematical physics about these theories. They're of great interest. And Smirnov and Zamolodzikov were interested in understanding what kinds of deformations can you do to preserve this structure of integrability. Now, having these S matrices all factorize into two to two S matrices is one representation or one manifestation of this underlying feature of integrability. But the one that Smirnov and Zamolodzikov choose to focus this analysis on was the feature that these theories possess an infinite power of conserved charges and currents. So they have basically uh, a tower of conserved currents of basically every spin. And the 
this, this tower starts at spin two. So spin one is possible, it's, but it's optional. So, so you can have a charged current in your theory, and then you can have sort of the uh, conservation associate of that of that current. But every theory has a stress tensor, which is a spin two current, which is preserved. And then you have higher uh, versions of this. And the basic idea is to say, well, the conservation of the stress tensor is a conservation of energy momentum. And everyone who's taken a course in quantum field theory is familiar with how the conservation of energy momentum constrains scattering. All right, I mean, it's, it's built into every single derivation we do in quantum field theory. Now, say it wasn't just the momentum, but it was also sort of, so, so the energy and momentum are like linear and quadratic combinations of the momentum, right? Uh, which, which we are conserving, and that gives us some constraints. But now what about say some order three polynomial in the momenta that also needs to be conserved and an order four, all the way to arbitrarily high order. Mm -hmm. The conservation of this tower of higher spin currents basically corresponds to having those additional conserved quantities as well in these integrable theories. And it is the demand of having to preserve all those or, or conserve all those additional quantities that constrains the S matrix to factorize into a product of two to two S matrices. And the thing is that in two dimensions, kinematics works out just right for it to be possible to be interacting while still preserving all these symmetries. Try and go to higher dimensions. The only theories that would respect those higher symmetries are free theories. Right, so it just, you can just have flyby interaction. Oh, no interaction, it's just flyby scattering. So- uh, <laughs> A very boring world, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, so th this feature is, is an important one, this feature of having these, uh, this tower of infinite higher spin conserved charges. So in the logical best, well, what can we do to the theory that preserves the conservation of such a tower? And they found that there was a family of quadratic combinations of these currents, which you can add to the theory, which will preserve this feature. And the first of those currents is a stress tensor. And the first of those quadratic combinations is the operator TP bar that I've written down here. So that was the original context in which it was discovered. And what they showed was that you can actually track what happens to the spectrum of energy eigenvalues of the theory if you are to put it on a cylinder, that is, if you are to put it on a spatial circle and you interpret the height of the cylinder to be time, you can track what happens to the energy spectrum of the theory under this deformation. So given the energy levels of your original integrable theory on the cylinder, when we do this deformation, we can in principle compute what the new energy levels are as a function of the deformation parameter. And that was studied in more detail in this top paper by Cavalli and collaborators. And they employ techniques coming from the thermodynamic Vetiansatz and um, other uh, integrability related tools which basically allow you to relate the energy spectrum to the S matrices. And I should also mention that how these deformations modify the two to two S matrix is that they just multiply by a phase. And this multiplication by a phase is to be seen as a kind of dressing of the external states that are undergoing the scattering. And so this aspect of gravitational dressing is also baked into the story. And, and that was, um, studied in a paper by Dubovsky, Gorbenko, and Mirbavai, which I haven't copied here, but it's, it's a great paper. So now let's go back to this operator here. So, so we have this quadratic combination of stress tensors, and we have that the energy momentum tensor is conserved, and we shall maintain this feature along the deformation, right? So, so those are the things that constrain the exercise. And what you can show is that at every step of deforming the theory, so, so, so one step is to start with the original theory and then add with a small parameter, add with a small parameter, T bar T, where the stress tensor is computed from S zero. The next step, 
would be to then compute the stress tensor from this entire combination and then x So this notation here says, take the theory at order lambda, compute its stress tensor, form TT bar and add it to the action, right? Okay. And then you can guess what the next term is going to look like. Yeah, it's just a recursive definition, I think, right? Exactly. So the, the point I'm trying to make here is that we have basically a notion of uh, deformation, which doesn't just involve adding a particular operator to your seed theory. Instead, what we have is a recursive definition, which can be encapsulated as a flow equation. So let's write it like this. So there's a differential equation that defines a one parameter family of quantum field theories, which start at the one you chose to deform, right? So that this S zero theory provides the initial condition for this differential equation. And the claim is that this differential equation or its solution, the integral curve, is a well-defined trajectory on the space of quantum field theories. That's a strong claim because this is an irrelevant operator. The fact that the energy momentum tensor is conserved and that we're preserving this word identity means that its scaling dimension is protected under the renormalization group. And so its scaling dimension in two dimensions is two. So this combination is going to have scaling dimension four which is two more than two, and therefore this is an irrelevant operator. And normally you would expect that if you were to add an irrelevant operator to your theory, then all bets are off. We don't actually know what happens to that theory as you increase lambda. We certainly won't know what happens as you decrease lambda. It just goes back to S0 if S0 is a conformal field theory. Right? That, that's, the, that's what the renormalization group does. However, to go in the opposite direction, to be able to pick up every higher order in lambda, basically to be able to solve this flow equation, relies on special properties of this operator. And that is basically the fact that the energy momentum tensor is a well-defined current at any point along this flow, because it's just a node there current for the point grain variance. And moreover, what uh, Smirnov and Zamolochikov showed, or rather actually with Zamolochikov in an earlier paper, showed was that the expectation value of TT bar, uh, especially on flat spaces, um, factorizes, meaning it has a well-defined meaning uh, for any quantum field theory. So this composite operator, that is this quadratic combination evaluated at a point X defines a local operator. It's a non-trivial fact. Uh, which, you know, if you think about a, gener a generic quantum field theory in two dimensions, you would expect that, well, if I just took an operator, tried to square it, then the OPE would tell me that there's going to be an infinite series of uh, other operators that this would generate. And if I was not in a conformal field theory, then, well, this is not even going to be a necessarily local expression, right? So here, the fact that you're doing this and defining a local operator is a remarkable one. And um, uh, th this, this has led to an explosion of interest in the quantum field theory and integrable field theory world about studying these theories, their generalizations, and so on. Now, what does this have to do with holography? Right, so, so we, we've stepped completely away from gravity uh, in this current discussion, but let's take one step closer which is uh, through the root of the gauge gravity correspondence or the holographic duality. So um, 
this paper by Mikko, Meza, and Verlinde showed that if we took ADS CFD in bulk dimension three, so I have gravity in three dimensions in spaces of negative cosmological constant being dual to a two dimensional conformal field theory that lives on the boundary. And then we deformed the CFD by TT bar in just the same way as Smirnov's homological told us to, except that we use the opposite sign of the deformation parameter that they suggest. The resulting theory, when seen from the perspective of the bulk gravitational theory, corresponds to gravity in now a negative uh, space with negative cosmological constant, but with a radial Dirichlet wall. So instead of the asymptotic boundary, we instead have a Dirichlet wall, which is at finite radial distance from any point in the bulk. And on this wall lives now the deformed holographically dual theory, which is the CFD deformed by TT bar. And they were able to show that the famous uh, energy level formula, which I alluded to in the previous discussion, corresponded to the calculation of the quasi-local energy of this configuration. So say we had some BTZ black hole bound in a finite Dirichlet wall. There is a prescription to calculate the quasi-local energy of this configuration. And what Mikomez and Berlinde showed was that if we relate the radial position of the wall to the TT bar deformation parameter, then we have an exact match between the quasi-local energy computed in the bulk and the deformed energy level coming from the TT bar deformation of the original CFD state. And just to recap again, in traditional ADS CFD, the ADM mass or ADM energy of a BTC black hole maps to the energy computed on a cylinder of the conformal field theory, where now the cylinder is the asymptotic boundary. So, so there's this one-to-one -one mapping. And this mapping just follows through under the deformation by TT bar. Now there were numerous other checks of what happens to holography in this finite cutoff setting once you deform by TT bar. Krauss, Lou, and Marolf had a nice paper about uh, where they were discussing um, more local objects, more local correlation functions. And um, I had a paper with my collaborator, Will Donnelly, about entanglement entropy. And there's an understanding of how all these objects map between the Balkan boundary under the deformation. So we have uh, quite a bit of confidence, I would say, that there is a fully fledged holographic dictionary in spaces of finite space time volume, basically, where we have a finite patch of ADS bound by a Dirichlet wall on which lives a CFD deformed by this irrelevant operator, TT bar. Right, so this is a very nice story. Furthermore, in dimension three, there was a generalization of this deformation involving now not only TT bar, but the boundary cosmological constant. So Gorbenko, Silverstein, and Torova showed that this modified deformation takes you from a time-like finite world tube in ADS to a time-like finite world tube in DS. So finite patch holography allows us not only to describe finite patches of ADS space, but to even transgress into the sitter space. And then we can be very serious about thinking about the holographic principle as a genuine hypothesis to entertain about the nature of quantum gravity in say our universe. So th this is what excites me about it. The problem though, is everything we've discussed so far is in two dimensions, right? In the two dimensional boundary case or in the three dimensional bulk case. So, these authors came along and argued that if we are to take this to dimensions higher than two, we're gonna to have to be a little bit more modest. We're gonna to have to focus on CFDs that have a large end limit and are expected to have a 
classical holographic bulk dual, right? So this is a much narrower class of CFDs than the ones we were discussing before, which were essentially like any CFD in two dimensions where you could form a stress tensor, you could deform by TT bar. Here, we're being a bit more modest, we say, well, okay, let's limit our attention to conformal field theories that are expected to have a bulk dual and have a large end limit. Well, I mean, that's the nature of all theories that have a, a large radius bulk dual. And they defined for such theories, uh, the so-called T squared deformation. Now the T squared deformation has the following form. Again, this is just an abuse of notation. Uh, but what, what we mean by this is an expression, which is again quadratic in the energy, energy momentum tensor. So D here is the boundary dimension. And as you can see, if, we, if D was two, this would be one. And that takes us back to TT bar as we had it before. Whereas this is the higher dimensional generalization. And what they showed was the finite radius dictionary as it was extrapolated in the two dimensional case also can be extrapolated in the higher dimensional case provided that we deform our holographic CFT by this irrelevant operator. So let's give a little bit of intuition as to why, right? So, so just, just a hint coming from canonical gravity, and then we can move into our discussion of the kernel and so on, and its relation to massive gravity. So we see here an expression which has the following combination. It's like the trace of t squared minus one over d minus one times the trace of t whole squared, which can be written as well, let me use let me use notation that's uh, consistent with uh, the presentation that we make. Where this structure is called the DeWitt supermetric. Okay. And the DeWitt supermetric is exactly the structure that appears in the ADM constraints. Right? And the interesting thing about the structure is if we look at its inverse, so, so, okay, first, the supermetric appears in the ADM constraints in the following form. I'll write it schematically. Um, if we take if we take the momentum conjugate to the metric, which we call pi, and now we're talking about the metric induced on a Cauchy surface or any co-dimension one surface. Um, so like in our previous ADM notation, we have gamma being that metric. So this is the ADM Hamiltonian constraint whose quantization is the wheeler witt equation. And this structure is what sits in the, in the kinetic term. So we're starting to see why this might have something to do with gravity, right? So this is a, okay, this is gonna have the same dimensions as we have here in the gauge gravity duality, right? This is like a boundary object. Um, and also it's got this uh, one over D minus one, just as it's supposed to. And now just a teaser about what it might have to do with uh, our discussion of deconstruction, massive gravity and all that. It so happens that, okay, now the notation is going to get a bit weird, but bear with me. If we take the inverse, well, well let me write it like this. Um, if we take the inverse of this object and 
in contract uh, two extrinsic curvature tensors. In fact, any two tensors, but we'll take extrinsic curvature just because they're the relevant objects to appear in this expression. Then, well, we get the um, the famous combination of trace of k squared minus trace k whole squared, which also appeared in the trace poly term, which also appeared in the deconstructed form of the uh, yeah. Yeah, of the uh, gravity action, which we used in, um, in, in massive gravity. So this is just a teaser for why everything that we've been talking about so far have some connection to each other. And yeah. This is like was, this is yeah this is the fundamental like thing that connects all of them together. So it's just it's a weird confluence of like in Wheeler DeWitt it's showing up like you say because this is basically the inner product and the momentum. This is like the natural thing, uh, you can call it momentum or extrinsic curvature, whatever you want to call it. But like the the momentum for like the ADM system, um, this is a natural object in it. But then it turns out that um, kind of the inverse of this object becomes. Um, core to the mass term in Fritz Pauli and DRGT. And then this also turns out to be like the combination in T squared that like has all the nice properties that allows it to have a holographic interpretation. So it's a, it's a really cool, um, it's a really cool like relationship that like, or like uh, it's the cause of the relationship between all three of these things, which is very fascinating and very interesting, I think. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and to bring this point home, let's jump back to D equals two, right? And there, we go back to our discussion of the, these works. So what do, what do these papers do? Right, so, so we were talking about this, this formula for reconstructing ADS-CFT and so on. Well, the bottom line is that we can basically take the conformal field theory that we expect to be holographically dual to gravity in ADS3 and couple it to the quadratic DRGT mass term. The fact that it's the DRGT mass term was noticed by Andrew Tolley, the progenitor of DR, one of the progenitors of DRGT theory and uh, Nick's uh, PhD supervisor. And he basically showed that if you were to take um, the following expression, oh, sorry, so now it's just two, and um, very soon we shall introduce some notation that makes it um, a little bit easier to talk about these mass terms. But for now, we will just proceed with the wedge products that we've been dealing with so far. So this is the basic result. We start with the CFT, couple it to the quadratic DRGT mass term, integrate out E, the dynamical field line, and the result is the TT bar deformation of the original CFT. Resum to all orders. As we had, I mean, as we recall, I mean, we only defined this uh, action before through a flow equation. And there was this recursive definition, which implied that there was going to be an infinite series of corrections to the CFT action involving higher and higher powers of lambda and higher and higher powers of TT bar. But it turns out that all that can be resummed into this quadratic DRGT mass term. This expression was first written down by Laurent Friedel all the way in 2008, who showed that <laughs> Doing so allows us to take generating functions of conformal field theories and produce solutions to three-dimensional wheeler dewitt equations. Very nice connection. And uh, Andrew shortly followed, followed up by us, uh, my collaborators, uh, Edward Mazank and Ron, Ron Axoni. Notice that this is all connected to the TT bar deformation. Well, so did Mikko in Berlin, but, but we sort of like uh, cleared up some of the derivations and elaborated on this connection. Also gave some arguments about how this relates to gluing um, Dirichlet and mixed boundary conditions and so on. But anyway, we, we found this nice story about how uh, DT bar is connected with this quadratic mass term. And 
basically, Nick and I generalize this connection to all higher dimensions. Again, in the original context of the T-square deformation, which involved only large and holographic CFTs. So we have a recorded um, presentation about the key technical steps involved uh, in, in that paper. But uh, if Nick has anything to say, we can maybe have a little bit of a discussion beforehand. Um, I think we'll save the discussion for after, actually. I think it'll be nice. So I think we've given a nice um, introduction to the to the viewer who hasn't maybe seen all of this before. So um, yeah, maybe we can sure, go sure. into the technical details and then we can start talking. Yeah. OK, so I'll just pull up a little recording that I have uh, prepared here. So um, in just a second. Yeah, it is. It is interesting that these operators, um, on like on one hand, there would be called something called a generalized Kronecker delta symbol. On the other hand, there's kind of like the Wheeler DeWitt supermetric. Um, right. It's just it's it's very interesting uh, that these objects continuously appear in gravitational theories. Um, yeah, it's just a very cool, uh, very cool little observation. Yeah. So um, now. Yeah, let's go into those generalized Kronecker symbols tool uh, after this presentation because it will appear here. Yeah. But but here's a little presentation that we have which summarizes the key technical uh, steps involved in the paper. So just a second. Um, let's let's see. Um, yeah, here we go. Let me know if you can hear this. Hi, this is Vasu Sham and. Here is a short video summary of a paper I recently co-wrote with my collaborator Nicholas Ondo titled The Role of DRGT Mass Terms in Cutoff Holography and the randall sundram 2 Scenario. The central object of study in this paper are the quadratic mass terms of ghost-free massive gravity or DRGT theory. These mass terms involve two metrics or frame fields. We show how when we couple this mass term to the generating function of stress tensor correlators of a large n holographic conformal field theory and integrate out one of the frame fields, we generate the so-called t-squared deformation, which is equivalent to taking the holographic CFT from the asymptotic boundary of ADS space to a finite Dirichlet wall. We then show that upon linearizing the deformation and varying with respect to the remaining frame field, we obtain the equations of motion of the randall sundaram 2 scenario. We will begin with a discussion of cutoff holography. In particular, we will start from the bulk where we have Einstein gravity in a space with negative cosmological constant bound by a time-like surface of co-dimension 1, which sits at a finite radial distance from any point in the bulk. We then use the radial component of the Einstein equations, also known as the radial Hamiltonian constraint equation, to write the action on shell purely in terms of the extrinsic curvature of constant radius slices of the bulk. The penultimate of these slices is the boundary itself, which we call partial m. We keep the counter term, which is localized on the boundary only. The dependence of this object on the location of the radial cutoff is in the bound of integration along the radial coordinate. Therefore, if we are to vary the location of this cutoff and take the de derivative of the action with respect to it, we evaluate the Lagrangian on the boundary that is defined at r equals rc. Further, we can write the extrinsic curvature in terms of the Brown-York stress tensor and obtain the following 
quadratic combination of brown york stress tensors on the right-hand side of this flow equation. We call this the T-squared deformation. We now want to interpret this equation from the perspective of the holographically dual boundary theory. This theory, as mentioned before, won't necessarily be a conformal field theory anymore because the boundary isn't at asymptotic infinity anymore. But we will use the key entry in the holographic dictionary that relates the generating function of stress tensor correlators in the boundary theory, which depends on the source of the stress tensor, which is the metric, to the action on shell defined as a function of Dirichlet boundary data. In particular, we impose Dirichlet boundary conditions on the metric and use the Dirichlet boundary condition as the source for the dual conformal field theory. We then extrapolate this entry of the dictionary to finite radius and what we want to do in addition to say that the action curly S solves the flow equation defined before, is to find an expression for curly S in terms of log, C log ZCFT. This is accomplished through coupling log ZCFT to the quadratic DRGT mass term, in addition to the counter terms, an additional boundary cosmological constant term, and a term proportional to the conformal anomaly of the boundary CFT where it is present. The parameter epsilon, which is taken to be small, is the length cutoff of the CFT itself. It plays the role of the smallest scale in the problem. We can then show that the parameter lambda, the deformation parameter, which is related to the graviton mass plays the role of R sub C from a few slides ago, and that the same flow equation is satisfied when we take a derivative of curly S with respect to lambda as we did with taking derivatives with respect to R sub C, provided that we identify the energy momentum tensor computed by varying curly S with respect to F with the brown York stress tensor in the bulk. This is the key result of our paper. Then, if we are to take lambda to be small, that is, order of the cutoff, we linearize this deformation and find that the result is just to add to the CFT generating function the T squared operator built only of the stress tensor of the CFT itself. This then leads to an order epsilon correction to the CFT stress tensor to define the total stress energy momentum. This expression for the total energy momentum to order epsilon will play a key role in our discussion of brain world gravity that will now follow. We now change gears slightly and move away from having a finite Dirichlet wall in ADS space to instead considering two Z2 mirrored patches of ADS glued together along a co-dimension 1 surface that has a non-trivial, critically tuned tension sigma. We also entertain the possibility of having stress energy localized purely on this co-dimension 1 surface and use that to solve the junction conditions for the jump in the stress energy in the extrinsic curvature. The Z2 symmetry of the configuration tells us that the jump in the extrinsic curvature is given entirely in terms of the extrinsic curvature itself on one side. We then follow the recipe of Shiromizu, Maeda, and Sasaki to take the Einstein equations in the bulk and then induce Einstein equations along the brain having solved the junction condition for the jump in the extrinsic curvature as described in the previous slide.
we then drop a contribution to the boundary localized Einstein tensor that comes from the electric component of the bulk Weyl tensor. Doing so is equivalent to saying that there are no spin 2 excitations propagating in the bulk that can then be coincident on the boundary. It is then customary to drop the quadratic term appearing on the right hand side of the middle equation and calling the resulting equation the boundary Einstein equations or the brain world Einstein equations. However, if we are to keep this contribution, we notice that the total stress energy tensor is nothing but the stress energy tensor from the previous slide where we were deforming the CFD by the T squared deformation to order epsilon. The interpretation is that on the locus of joining between the two Z2 mirrored patches of ADS lives the holographic CFT now cut off but also now subject to Einstein gravity. The RS mechanism provides the origin for the non-trivial gravitational field but what wasn't entirely understood or articulated in the literature was what the notion of cutoff is that is relevant in this context. We see here that it is in fact the T squared deformation that arises from coupling the CFT to the DRGT mass term and integrating out one of the two frame fields or metrics that appear in this mass term and linearizing the deformation that provides the appropriate notion of cutoff. These are the key two results of our paper. If you found this presentation interesting, please do read the paper itself. And if you have any questions, please forward them to the email addresses provided in the paper. Thank you for your attention. Well, <laughs> that probably requires a bit of elaboration. <laughs> yeah, um, I'll, I think, yeah, I'm glad that we at least got to unpack uh, a bit at the beginning before discussing that. I think um, one useful TLDR that might uh, help the viewer is thinking of this kind of through the, uh, I think it's pronounced the Friedel kernel. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's a, a useful way to kind of like think about things, right? So like if we think about what the T squared deformation is doing, it's essentially stating that we have this flow equation. And then you could imagine asking yourself, okay, cool, we have, we see flow equations all the time in physics, right? Uh, a heat equation being a famous one, of, being a famous one, right? Um, mm -hmm. And we can sort of turn around and ask, okay, is there a way to create a uh, Green's function or kernel to actually just flat out to solve the equation right so um you're at least or at least i should say create like an integral expression of what the solution has to look like um and in essence that's what we've done right what we found is the kernel that solves the flow equation and it turns out that it's massive gravity um coupled to the cft plus a, cu a couple other extra terms and then it turns out that this kernel is deconstruction but a couple like little corrections. So it's not perfectly deconstruction. Uh, for one thing, it's missing the Einstein-Hilbert term. So it's not like a canonically, like from a mass gravity perspective, it's very weird because you would expect it to be like this, like you'd expect it to have a canonical kinetic term and it doesn't. Um, and then the other thing is we have to kind of like pot patch in this, uh, this uh, cosmological constant piece, which that part's less uh, concerning because you could just imagine, oh, we, for various reasons, due to tension or something like that, we have some cosmological p uh, piece on the boundary. But um, yeah, it is, it is interesting how close it comes to deconstruction without kind of actually finally being deconstruction. Yeah, on that point, we did have a bit of a, a discussion of that um, <clears throat> in, our, in our actual paper. Um, so in, let me see. Uh, in one of the sections, what we showed was that the deconstruction answer doesn't quite um, 
give us the relationship between the extrinsic curvature and the discretized derivative that we would actually want. <laughs> yeah. So if I may go into our paper, right? Mm -hmm. So here it is. Um, please do read it. Um, what we show is in, right. So in section seven, I suppose. Right, so, so here we actually try and set out to do the deconstruction as we discussed in the, in the discussion previous to the presentation, where we just take the higher dimensional Einstein gravity action and we take the terms involving the extensive curvature. And then we try to discretize these Ks, which are derivatives of the frame fields with respect to R, that is the extra coordinate, and get something that looks like this. The term that you don't get by doing this is the term that looked like this cosmological constant det f. Now, here's the deal. Let's take this expression and then compute the variation of it with respect to f, right? We expect that whatever that should be should take us back to k, right? When we relate the momentum, that is, you know, take the action on shell, and then you vary with respect to f, and then you relate the resulting thing to the momentum through Hamilton Jacobi theory back to the extensive curvature. So that doesn't really happen unless you add an extra dead f term. So <laughs> in order to pass the self consistency of this expression being discretized and put back in here, you need the extra dead f term. Uh, so, so in some sense, we are preserving the, uh, the essence of, of deconstruction, uh, although not quite at the action level, but, but at the level of uh, objects such as K. So the, the, the intuition isn't entirely off. Yeah, this is true. And now we should also say that you're right that we didn't include the Einstein-Hilbert term. And the difference is the following. Normally, what you would do is to look at the general relativity action, do the d plus one split, and then rewrite the extensive curvature squared term in terms of e minus f. And then the resulting theory will have something quadratic in e minus f, and you'll have the Einstein-Hilbert term, and that looks like the DRGT action. What we did was we didn't go with the off-shell Einstein-Hilbert action, but we went with the on-shell action that only involves the extensive curvatures, and then it involves some boundary contributions, right? And therefore, we basically didn't have the Einstein-Hilbert action to compare with, but because it was the action on shell in a space with negative cosmological constant, we were able to use ADS-CFT to argue that the CFT generating function should be part of the boundary action. And so it's a, it's a bit of a twist on that logic, which was ultimately uh, allowing us to provide this kind of expression purely from just um, arguing about deconstructing the annular action on shell. So that was sort of the, uh, another sort of thematic difference between the original deconstruction idea and this idea. And here it kind of matters because, um, on shell and off shell have some big differences when we're talking about holography. I mean, in holography, we really only know what the action on shell means. Knowing what the action off shell means is a subtle thing. And it's only through these funny deformations and their structure could you guess what that is. Um, but that's, uh, that's a sort of separate discussion. Um, so so there's, a, there's a lot of that spirit that's still left in there. Now, one thing we didn't explain is what these delta sub D symbols are, and they're the generalized um, Kronecker delta symbols, yep. and their definition is here in the paper. So what we mean by them, if we use just the um, one kind of space-time indices, is the following antisymmetrization of one set of indices in a product of Kronecker deltas. Presumably this is missing some factorial sign somewhere, but let's just say that it's implicit in our definition of the, the angle brackets. With this object at hand, we can actually define a lot of uh, nice things such as what the determinant of H is. And 
we can also discern some interesting uh, relations between the generalized conic curves and the delta symbol of some product of arbitrary objects times h to some other power and the determinant of h times the generalized conic curve delta of d minus d minus two, so d delta two <laughs> of just this combination. And this is sort of, this is the, the, the key relation that underlies all of what we do. <laughs> yeah, just to, yeah, yeah, I'll just give a, a brief statement here because I, I think it's important. So uh, this notation, I think I, I developed uh, during my PhD thesis just to make things less crazy. Um, so these generalized chronic or delta symbols show up in a bunch of places. So they're, they're kind of the objects that are fundamentally behind wedge products themselves. Uh, they're behind um, uh, determinants and they're also behind uh, symmetric polynomials. So in fact, this is, this is actually providing the definition of what we would typically refer to as a symmetric polynomial. And the reason why it has the name symmetric polynomial is unlike wedge products where you're just uh, anti-symmetrizing over a single index. Every time you permute the objects, you pick up a minus sign. But the beauty of having objects that have two indices on them, which is how we're able to create this symmetric polynomial, is that the two minus signs make a plus. So mm -hmm. if every time you permute objects past each other, you pick up two minus signs, then it's not an anti-symmetric object like a wedge product, it's a symmetric object. And so we can just drop the indices as long as we assume one is raised and one is lowered. Uh, then the equation that we see in three 3.9 um, allows us to write things like 3.12, where we just don't have to put the indices down because they're all assumed. They get contracted into this uh, totally anti-symmetric object. Um, so it's totally anti-symmetric in its top indices, and it's totally anti-symmetric in its bottom indices. And this allows us to basically not have to go through the, the trouble of writing down all these indices. And it also allows us to know that we can freely permute any of these objects. Like the order of the objects doesn't matter. It's, it's a fully commutative algebra inside of the, uh, of the symmetric polynomial symbol. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So uh, Nick, I suppose, introduced it. And um, we have now pushed it uh, <laughs> a bit further. And hopefully, it'll be adopted adopted more broadly, uh, because certainly these objects are useful and they'll be needed in <laughs> a lot of games that are yet to be played. Um, yeah. So we, we did manage to bring some of the wisdom of deconstruction to bear, and we did manage to show how these various seemingly related topics that have some structures in common between them actually have uh, a role to play. Uh, so, so the, there were these structures we described, the supermetric, the generalized Kronecker symbols, the DRGT mass term, which look similar, but, but it turns out that they're actually all related uh, in, through holography to you know, different theories. Um, and so th 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 that's actually quite nice, um, and it, it doesn't generally happen, but, but it is a nice clue to say that, well, if you see some similar structures, then maybe should dig. Uh, it's, it's a sign to maybe dig a bit further to see whether there's any uh, structural connection between the different theories. Uh, but in our discussion so far, we haven't spent too much time talking about the brain world gravity uh, part of the story. And uh, perhaps we should elaborate on that because I found that in the presentation I spent too little time. Um, so it's in the title of the paper, uh, but I, I, I didn't really spend as much time on it. But basically, there was a question uh, posed by Borati, uh, Kani Hamed, and Randall, which was, you have the RS2 setting, which takes a certain kind of brain, puts it in ADS space, induces gravity on that brain. And this was a remarkable um, theoretical achievement to see how you can trap gravity in a lower dimensional space while still having an infinite extra dimension. So this is like a precursor to all warp compactifications. And uh, there has been a, a sea of phenomenological literature that has come out of that. But uh, at the very same time, gravity in ADS was expected to be dual to conformal field theory that lives on the asymptotic boundary. Right? So ADS CFT is expected to hold uh, quite well. And so the question is, uh, if we just put the absolute values uh, on the warp factor, which is in essence what the RS2 scenario does, what happens? Like, how is the CFT modified? And there was an answer at the word level which said, 
oh, the CFD now lives on what's called a Planck brain, which is the uh, locus of joining between the two mirrored patches of ADS. And it is now subject to gravitational forces. So there's general relativity that is dynamical. And this is like general relativity that didn't quite decouple. You see now, if we did nothing to the warp factor, we would have the usual decoupling argument that said that the asymptotic boundary is truly asymptotic and it's free from the effect of the gravity somewhere deep in the bulk. However, that doesn't happen anymore. So you have general relativity still, and then the CFT is cut off in some way. And what way was left as a little bit nebulous. We will go back to that discussion and we'll find that our answer is a somewhat satisfying one given what was in that original paper. But first, let's see how you are just led to discover that these T-squared deformations play a role, right? So I briefly touched upon this exercise, but we can go through it in some amount of detail. So the idea is we have a brain of some tension that sits between two Z2 mirrored patches of ADS-T plus one. ADS-T plus one has the following uh, Einstein equations on it. Right, which I've written in frame field notation. Now, what we can do is just in, ask what the induced Einstein tensor is on this d-dimensional surface using the Gauss equations. Right, and the Gauss equations relate uh, Ricci curvature to, or rather it relates Riemann curvature in d-dimensions, uh, so d plus one dimensions to Riemann curvature in d-dimensions plus extrinsic curvature contributions, right? And, the full expression here is 4.2 is exact, right? So this is just a result of using geometry plus the Einstein equations here. And here we have the object that I mentioned in the presentation, but didn't explicitly write down, which is the electric component of the bulk wild tensor. That electric component is basically the bulk wild tensor with the normal contracting two of the indices and the other two indices being projected onto D dimensions through the frame field F. And so saying that we have empty ADS space with no gravitational waves means that we can set this to zero. However, when you mentioned that there were these uh, masses that appeared in brain world scenarios for the gravitational field that is induced on the brain, um, those all come from this thing here. So you, you linearize these equations and then you ask, about the fluctuation spectrum in the D dimensions, such so as going to be the uh, Einstein gravity in D dimensions that plays a role. Um, in the critically tuned uh, RS setting, turns out that that is all you will have. Whereas if you detune the tension, this term is gonna to start to give you contributions, which uh, will look like having a continuum of massive states and so on. So th this is an important contribution actually, when you do the fluctuation analysis. But here we're not really looking at the fluctuations, we're just looking at the background. And so what we do there is first eliminate the extrinsic curvature because we wanna think intrinsically on this d-dimensional space, right? So if we get rid of E, which is extraneous, then all we have left to do is deal with K, right? And to deal with K, we have to solve the so-called junction conditions. Right, so junction conditions say that the jump in the extrinsic curvature between the two uh, Z2 mirrored patches is given in terms of a surface stress energy tensor. But the Z2 symmetry tells us that K plus is minus K minus. So we can just solve for K plus or K minus. And what we find is that K plus or K minus, minus K minus rather, is given by the uh, Supermetric contracting with S, surface stress tensor. And that's just the only step we need. Uh, we, we plug it in and then we turn the crank and we get to 4.12, which is the expression that I had on the, on the slide. And there what we do is we say, oh, um, drop this quadratic term and you have Einstein's equations in, in, induced on the brain with zero cosmological constant. Uh, that, that's wonderful. But don't drop that contribution and what you actually see. Okay, so, so before we don't, let's, let's say we just drop it. Here the uh, holographic intuition is that this energy momentum tensor is provided by the cutoff CFT, CFT cutoff in some fashion, right? And now it's subject to Einstein gravity. That's why it sources um, the dynamics of the metric field. However, let's not throw that away. Let's keep that contribution. 
and you find that actually it's the CFD deformed by the T-squared operator to order one. This is the first order T-squared deformation. And there's this natural sense from the scale radius duality that a radial cutoff in the bulk corresponds to some kind of UV cutoff on the boundary. Right? So, so that's the sense in which the T-squared deformation is a kind of cutoff theory. And here we see that it's exactly the notion of cutoff that is relevant to the physics of uh, brain world gravity. So this was a little loop uh, that needed to be closed uh, in the literature, and, and I'm glad that we managed to do it. And I thank uh, Victor Gorbenko for uh, first uh, asking this question to me a long time ago at the Perimeter Institute. Um, but anyway, um, this is sort of how the brain world story sits uh, in the middle of all of this. And let's briefly jump to the paper uh, of Borati, Arkani Hamed, and uh, Randall, where they talk a little bit about what they need from this cutoff theory. So it's titled Holography and Phenomenology, and this is where the term Planck brain was uh, coined. Right, so um, here they discuss the holographic interpretation of both RS2 and RS1. Uh, we limited our attention to RS2, um, and we will come back to RS1 at some point. But, but basically, if we weren't thinking about the dynamical equations, but we were just looking at expressions for the metric, then the effect of having this kind of uh, Z2 orbit folding and uh, having this brain in the middle is to replace the warp factor with uh, basically the sort of absolute value of the warp factor here. And so they call this locus Z equals zero, the Planck brain. Okay. Right? And there's some discussion about what should happen there, but then they say, well, okay, we need to be a little more precise about cutting off the CFT. And they talk about how there's a way to cut off the CFT such that the low energy theory is you know, no longer conformal, right? Uh, but what they need is something where conformal invariance is broken uh, in such a way that once you ignore the Planck suppressed operators, you get back to conformal invariance. So this is exactly what the T squared deformation is doing. Right, so, so it's not like adding certain mass terms. So this is what they even need to so say that um, we need a conformal theory. So, so if you want, oh, sorry, uh, where did they actually mention this? Um, yeah, so, so, okay. This is just an example to give of how breaking by like say some mass terms or something, relevant deformation doesn't quite do the job, mm -hmm. right? Um, and um, I guess at the time, nobody knew about these, these T-squared like deformations, but they're ones that do exactly what you need. They're the relevant operator deformations. And as you take their deformation uh, parameter to zero, you recover CFT behavior. Whereas you see, if you had added masses, then the IR behavior, because it's a relevant deformation, is going to be a massive theory. And so it'll just not have the, the conformal symmetry that remains. Um, because you're going in the wrong direction in the IP flow. So um, yeah, I think that this is actually good to point out. Um, and I'm just curious to hear more from that community. Uh, if any of them are watching this, uh, please reach out to us about what we could do next. Um, so yeah. Yeah, the irrelevant operator aspect of it is interesting because um, at least for if you have, well, obviously we don't for this particular scenario, but for your standard mass of gravity scenario, you do have the Einstein uh, Hilbert term, which is playing the role of a canonical kinetic term uh, that goes with the mass term and together they form mass of gravity. Um, it's interesting when you have those two together, you also end up with a family of irrelevant operators um, distinct from the ones that come from general relativity, obviously general relativity has a whole infinite tower of irrelevant operators, um, but you get a second set that come in at lower energies and actually paying attention to the energy scale that they had to go into is actually uh, how um, Claudia, Andrew and Gabadev, or Gregory um, 
created DRGT in the first place. They were starting to play around with guessing where the energy scale would come in. Um, there was like this naive assumption that it had come in um, way lower. And it turns out that you can tune your operations to raise the energy scale. And that tuning is the one that gets you uh, DRGT mass of gravity. Um, but yeah, it is, it is interesting that these irrelevant operators uh, play a role in these theories that is kind of as of yet understood. Uh, they kind right. of ended up becoming a big stumbling block for uh, massive gravity in general, because if we want to take the idea that massive gravity is some could be hypothetically some fundamental system of gravity, then you, these irrelevant operators are precisely the things that cause problems uh, in interpreting and understanding that theory. They're the things that give rise to uh, potentially superluminal modes and some other problems that uh, arise in the theory. So there's a interesting relationship there. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, we should demarcate that there's different notions of irrelevant we're talking about here, which, um, of course, uh, you know, at the time when DRGT theory was first being constructed, uh, the question was mostly about uh, gravitational theory in and of itself, right? No relation to holography or anything. And there, well, what are we talking about uh, being irrelevant with respect to us, uh, with respect to the Gaussian fixed point defined by non interacting gravitons? Right. So if you wanted to think of, uh, if you wanted to guess what the high energy behavior of uh, uh, gravity was, and you thought that it was going to be a theory of, of free gravitons that were too energetic to uh, interact with each other, you'd be wrong, right? Which is the essential problem of non-renormalizability of general theory. Yeah. Uh, it's as simple as that, though. It's as simple as saying, well, that's just the wrong guess for what the high energy behavior should be. Um, and then in trying to pursue that, you would just discover how things don't quite work out. Um, and so what you're saying is that, well, uh, there's a certain pattern of irrelevant operator deformations that uh, correct the behavior of this uh, free theory that you guessed at high energies. In fact, it's actually corrected by an infinite series of, of other, other terms yeah. coming from just general relativity. And what you're talking about is a distinct series of irrelevant operators yeah. that come from uh, massive gravity, right? So, so now we're, yeah. we're still talking about irrelevance with respect to bulk power counting in comparison with the non-interacting graviton fixed point action. Whereas here in the t squared deformation story, we're talking about irrelevance with respect to the dual CFT. Yep. Right, so, so we're talking about a one lower dimensional conformal field theory uh, which is then deformed by some irrelevant operator. And it's, uh, it's fascinating because um, the mass term is also still in the boundary, right? So, so it's like <laughs> there is a series of irrelevant operator deformations that come in. And those are the second class that you were discussing that go to correct the um, free kinetic term of uh, general relativity but now come to correct some interacting conformal field theory. And the physics of what exactly happens here is something that we really should work out because it's, it's a very fascinating question. Uh, there's, there's a yeah. special class of theories where you can follow the effects of these deformations, like you have large end theories. Uh, in two dimensions, you can follow them in almost any theory. And I suppose that that was something that nobody in massive gravity actually thought would happen uh, modulo these discussions of asymptotic fragility, which uh, you, should, you should certainly uh, elaborate on because uh, they were close to a supervisor's heart. Uh, still are. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was just this very strange idea that we were, well, I shouldn't say we because I wasn't a part of it, but uh, Andrew and one of, another grad student that he had were interested in the question of, actually, let me first state this really quickly. So I, I discussed before that there's these there's this new additional tower of irrelevant operators that comes in at a massive gravity at, a, at an energy way, way, way lower than M Planck. Um, in fact, it's, it's forced to be like parametrically quite smaller than M Planck. Um, and the interesting thing is, is if you kind of like isolate this out, because as I said before, um, back at the beginning, if you have a massive theory, you now have new degrees of freedom. And these interactions effectively are taking place in, in between these new degrees of freedom uh, that you have in your theory. And what's interesting is that uh, you can kind of like isolate them out and try to like 
play some scaling games where you try to focus on just what are the lowest order and most important, and you end up with something called uh, Galilands that come out of it, which were uh, not out of Red Sundrum theory. Actually, they came out of the uh, DGP scenario, uh, different brain world scenario um, that came out, I think, a couple, like a year or two after the Randall Sundrum scenario. But anyways, you end up with these uh, particular type of scalar interactions and scalar operators that uh, are higher dimensional. And uh, they, they just, sorry, are higher um, are higher order in their uh, irrelevancy. So mm -hmm. they're quite irrelevant operators with like higher derivatives in this case. It's not like normally when we think about irrelevant, actually this is important to say as well. As, in this case, it's not just that they're irrelevant because it's like phi to the six or something like that, right? It's that it's like box, box, phi, um, but the patterns come in, in such a way that the equations of motion remain second order, which is a bizarre feature uh, that people aren't used to thinking about. Uh, and then they have a bunch of very weird quantum properties due to that. Um, but yeah, basically, the, it's kind of naively, you would just assume these irrelevant operators uh, couldn't have a Wilsonian uh, UV completion. Um, and so basically, uh, Andrew and uh, his uh, other graduate student, Luke Keltner, um, explored this quite a bit. Like, how, like, could you come up with any type of uh, scenario? And actually, it was a right around that time that they were looking into that was when, um, gosh, who was it again? The, um, the original paper that coined asymptotic fragility. Uh, it was like 2013 or 2014. The, yeah, Dubovsky, the Dubovsky at all paper uh, mm -hmm. came out and they started looking at that. So they kind of had like this, uh, this like loose picture of like, it could be the, it could like a certain collection of facts could come together and it could explain how you could keep something consistent. Um, but there wasn't quite a proof as to how exactly it would kind of all fit together. Uh, so it's interesting mm -hmm. that we're coming back to this and then T squared has this whole story, at least two dimensions where it's like, oh no, no there is asymptotic fragility, like for sure. Um, right. and, and, we, and we sort of understand it in the two dimensional case right. for how it has to work out. Um, and then in the higher dimensional case, I think we still don't really know um, if the, like the status of those theories, right? Right, from right. on holographic so, grounds, yeah. Yeah, so well, I, I suppose that we can uh, share briefly what the um, paper is that um, identified this asymptotic fragility in the context of uh, the TT bar deformation. And mm -hmm. This is the one by Dubovsky, Gorbenko, and Mirbavai. And what they showed was that if you looked at, yes, if you just looked at the S matrix, uh, for some matter theory coupled to JT gravity. And this is a little bit of a red herring because actually what they want to say here is DRGT theory. And in this limit where you have a flat background metric, it kind of looks like they did this, this JT gravity theory. But what they basically do is work out what kind of uh, dressing the various mode functions are going to have as a result of this gravitational coupling, right? And they work out how that affects uh, the S matrix when we then put this all through the um, LSD reduction formula. And you see that this schematic picture involves these funny shocks, like you have these little shock waves. You see that there's some <laughs> deformation here and that's a result of this uh, gravitational dressing, so to speak, right? So it's like saying that you've taken your coordinates and you made them dynamical fields. And you've done so in a way that you maintain the regular uh, behavior of the creation and annihilation operators. And what you do to the scattering states is dress them in a momentum dependent fashion. And this momentum dependent dressing is at the very heart of what the TT bar deformation does. And um, that's, that's, the, that's the essence of the relationship between gravitational dressing and TT bar. And it's also what they specifically mean by talking about an asymptotically fragile theory, meaning that it's um, a sort of dressed version of a, an otherwise decent quantum field theory. <laughs> right, so this is, like, this is like the intuition that they, that they kind of have. Um, and it's, it's just fascinating how this story is building. And certainly we don't have any definitive answers in the world of how wide this class of theories can be. But um, they are an interesting and novel UV behavior. I think that that's, that it really is a development of modern physics that now we have an understanding of a class of theories that have a novel UV behavior in comparison to most of what people expected in the past. And this has some chance of playing a role in how 
gravitation can be uh, completed in the ultraviolet. Um, and so, so that is perhaps the broader hypothesis that uh, all this points to. Uh, that yeah, yeah. Some... Very speculative, but it is, yeah, it's, <laughs> um, it, it is interesting that a lot of things kind of point in this direction, mm -hmm. I think. Um, yeah, I remember, I just don't take any of this as, as truth. I'm recalling like seven plus years ago. Um, but I think one of the interesting things that I remember in my discussions with Andrew on that asymptotic fragility paper that he had for Galileans, i.e. mass of gravity, um, was that like one of the interesting properties was basically this notion of like exponential boundedness. Because mm -hmm. um, there's a famous paper that if things are like polynomially bounds the um i don't know why i'm forgetting uh the paper i believe Dabosky was also on it um mm -hmm. and others but they basically showed that like you would naively expect from like galilean type theories or theories with like higher order derivatives uh which is exactly the type of thing you would expect from a stress energy squared right um that you would you would naively get um basically uh violations of unitarity but mm -hmm. then it sort of turns out that like if if you um don't have polynomial boundedness you know instead of exponential boundedness then there's this whole discussion over like locality you can't have a local theory that's exponentially bounded so then there becomes this like tension between um mm -hmm. when does like superluminality or unitarity violation occur if it will if it's like underneath the length scale because like now you basically have fundamental length scales in these theories um right. if it kind of occurs underneath the length scale it might just be the case that our understanding itself of locality just breaks apart completely um when you try to go under that energy scale obviously this famously comes up in gr um because uh what does it mean to have something that's like smaller than the Planck length and general relativity? Um, so yeah, right, it's, just, it's right. very, it's very interesting. Um, how a lot of these ideas that sort of have like a Wheeler DeWitt version and like a holographic version and a massive gravity version. It's, it's interesting. Um, th there's clearly some story here. I don't, I doubt that like the way that we're thinking about it now is like the ultimate or correct version of it, but it does sort of point to the fact that there might be something deeper here about um, non-local and asymptotically fragile theories being like a core part, not just of like the bulk theory, but actually the boundary theory is also some type of like, to us right now anyways, exotic, uh, exotic non-local field theory. Right. And you know, this, this question, I mean, this, this observation you make or that Andrew made about how you can have uh, irrelevant operators involving higher derivatives that you know, come together to do something uh, more well-behaved than you would have anticipated is also, uh, this is again a speculation, but it's also part of the TT bar story. And so now here I have the uh, paper of John Cardi where he computes the TT bar deformation of correlation functions. And this is a wonderful paper using uses some very creative and um, interesting techniques to actually uh, write down what the TT bar deformation of correlation functions uh, should be, um, which is given implicitly in terms of uh, the OP between the stress tensor and uh, whatever the uh, fields of the undeformed theory are. But nevertheless, one of the things that he shows is that part of what makes these theories solvable and what makes what allows him to compute these deformations is a phenomenon where you have a resummation of leading logs, just like you would in some asymptotically free theory, except you have factors of derivatives appearing. You see, he says that explicitly here. Apart from the factor of the Laplacian, this is very like what one would see in a locally renormalizable theory except that lambda retains its canonical dimension. And then he defines a scaling limit uh, for what the theories, uh, for, for what should happen. And in that scaling limit, the deformation of some correlation function is the smearing of that correlation function with a heat kernel, right? So this is, again, it's just so close to everything that we've discussed. And it kind of shows that, well, you see, if I just had in some renormalizable theory, a resummation involving the logs I normally know, but also this here, then, well, by just power counting, I would have anticipated that that would have been something irrelevant that would, you know, you know led to kind of corrections that I can control, but not really. 
right? And, and, and that's, that's the key to having this kind of uh, a result where you were nevertheless able to track the, uh, the effect of this deformation. And so this, this is actually, um, yeah, sort of a very interesting point of convergence of intuitions, which I think should be investigated further. Yeah, it's interesting you point out those the greens function to to smear them. Yeah, I remember another part of the story that they were talking about was I think they're called Jaff type non-localizable quantum field theories. I think this is something that I think it was Arthur Jaff studied. Mm -hmm. I think it was like the nineteen seventies or something. They were interested in the question of like, could you take non-localizable quantum field theories? I, I suspect this is back in the day when people still didn't really understand QCD. And so they were interested, like, could you do non, some crazy non-local stuff to try to explain the, the, the crazy and totally unexplainable um, QCD stuff? Um, yeah, all the, all the observations that we eventually figured out we could put into QCD. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting though. It'd be interesting if like these ideas are repurposed because I think part of the idea there is, is like you can't, um, I'm trying to remember the, the again, these details might be slightly wrong, but as I recall, the idea was roughly speaking that like you couldn't just directly take Fourier inverses from a momentum space into position space. And essentially it was due to the exponential bottom this kind of like broke the assumptions of what you would normally have for like being able to invert the Fourier transform. So mm -hmm. instead what you were able to do is, I can't remember the name, they're like some type of like test function or smearing function, or instead you would insert something that would kind of like smear out over that length scale. And then you could go ahead and take integrals in like a well-defined fashion. Um, again, That's that might not be might not be perfectly uh, accurate, but roughly speaking, that was uh, one of the ideas. And so these, these smearing functions actually kind of uh, were thought to play a really important role um, in these non-localizable quantum field theories. Um, so yeah, I, yeah, it'd be interesting to go back and tie a lot of the history of this stuff uh, together more closely, but uh, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, um, we've covered a lot of ground in this discussion. Uh, thank you, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, was, it was a great pleasure collaborating with you and I As do well. hope to continue to. Uh, at least to continue our discussions, uh, certainly. Uh, so yeah, if you like this, then uh, please leave a like below, uh, share, comment, uh, and uh, let us know what your questions are. Um, thank you for your attention. <laughs>